Karen Schollmeyer um, is one of our prize employees at Archaeology Southwest. Uh, she got her degree here in, at the Arizona State University, uh, focus on the information that can come out of studying faunal uh, materials. And this year's cafe focus is on what we're calling connections. Last year we focused on the what was underground here in the Phoenix area and what was underground in the Tucson area. This year we're looking at connections into the wider landscape outside of those urban areas. So uh, Karen's talk tonight is going to take a look at, as you can see on screen, life before AD 500 on the upper Gila where, um, in southwestern New Mexico. And she'll draw some connections from that larger landscape to the Phoenix area. So Karen, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here today to talk about the Upper Gila. And although the talk really focuses on the Upper Gila area, as Bill mentioned, I'll be making a lot of connections to Phoenix. And that's fun for me because I actually feel very connected to both the Upper Gila and Phoenix. My grandfather was born in Phoenix in 1918. So my family's lived in Phoenix for several generations. As Bill mentioned, I went to ASU for graduate school. Uh, and my grandparents moved to the Upper Gila to Mule Creek when I was a middle schooler. So I used to spend a lot of time on the Upper Gila in the town of Mule Creek when I was young. And then um, about the time I was finishing graduate school, my family no longer lived there. And I kind of thought, oh, I really liked that place. And it's too bad that I won't get to be there anymore. And then I ended up working at Archaeology Southwest, where one of the primary things I do is research on the Upper Gila, including running a field school in the Upper Gila. And we actually ran our field school out of the town of Mule Creek for several years. So it was kind of a weird uh, coincidence that was really lucky for me. So uh, the Upper Gila and Phoenix are very connected to me personally. And hopefully you see in this talk some of the ways that they're connected archaeologically as well. Here you can see a map of some of the places that I'm going to be talking about tonight. So here's the southwest with culture areas you're probably used to seeing, archaeological culture areas. The upper Gila, as I'm using it loosely in this talk, is the part of the Gila River that's in southwest New Mexico. And of course, here's Phoenix. And they're connected by the Gila River. So there's this river running between them. And I think to a lot of us, we see maps like this and we think, oh, that's a really long way. And they're in two different archaeological culture areas. And how connected can those places really be? And as I hopefully will convey in this talk, there are actually a lot of things that are similar and interesting changes that are happening at the same times in both places, and a lot of things that are just too similar to really be coincidences. So I'll be pointing out some of those. Um, but again, I think to a lot of us, it seems kind of not intuitive, especially if you're used to seeing maps of archaeological culture areas like this one, where the culture areas are different colors, and they're outlined in a sharp black line. And it looks like they're very, very different and very, very far apart. So if you're used to seeing things like this map from Wikipedia, each culture area has this black line around it. Oh, those are very different places. It looks like if you cross the line, suddenly everything's going to be different. And sometimes that can be the way that people talk about archaeological culture areas as well. But they don't really look like this. They don't have these sharp boundaries. And I think I was always told this, but I, it didn't start to really sink into me until I was kind of midway through graduate school and I started working in a different desert which was the Hadar region in Ethiopia. And a couple of things happened to me there that made me really reimagine how I was seeing people in the past in the Southwest. Uh, one of them, this is an ancient picture of me from, I think, 2000, uh, working in Ethiopia, and there's a camel in our camp. Uh, but one of the things that happened that really changed the way that I thought about the Southwestern landscape was to realize how unused I am to walking. I go hiking a lot. I think I'm in reasonable shape. Um, but one day, for a variety of silly reasons, we ended up getting one of our cars stuck deep, deep in the mud, and we couldn't get it out, and we were 18 miles from camp. And so we decided we would walk back to camp. So there's a bunch of archaeologists, and again, we're used to hiking. We started walking back to camp. We thought we were going pretty fast. After some hours, it became clear we were not going to get back to camp before it got dark. The local people who live where I was working are the Afar people. This is, incidentally, where Lucy the hominid fossil comes from. It's that region. So the Afar people who were with us kept getting more and more worried, and it started to get dark, and there's lions and hyenas and leopards and things like that out there. And they were quite concerned that we were going to somehow get hurt. So finally, a couple of the Afar 
guys we worked with came up to us and they said, oh, we, we don't think we're going to get back before dark. We think we should send somebody to run back to camp and get a truck to come and get everybody so that we're not walking back in the dark. We said, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. So one of the people who was walking with us was, again, I'm like 23 in this picture, but to me he seemed an old man and he walked with a cane and he's the one they sent back to the trucks. And again, we had thought, the Americans in the group had thought we were walking really fast trying to get back to the trucks. Um, the guy with the cane just took off. That was who they'd sent back to camp to get a truck to come. And he immediately started walking with his cane about three times as fast as I could possibly walk. And that really changed my view of how people walk around. <laughs> and I realized that the distances that I'm used to walking and the speed at which I'm used to walking are nothing compared to people who spend all their lives walking. Most of our workers had never been in a vehicle before they started working with us. So people who grow up walking long distances on a big landscape think of distances and time very, very differently than I think a lot of us with our much more sedentary way of living are used to thinking of them. So 250 miles between Phoenix and the Upper Gila was probably not as big a deal as we often tend to make it when we're looking at maps. The other thing that happened that really changed the way that I think about these landscapes is that when we drive between places, especially when we're driving to archaeological sites, we drive a long way and we don't really see anybody, and we tend to think of these landscapes as empty. So we think they're places with a long distance between sites and there's nobody in between them. Um, this landscape in the Hadar region, to me, looked pretty empty. Every once in a while we'd see a kid with some goats or something like that, but I didn't usually see people who weren't with us. Uh, one day, there was an incident where someone threw a grenade and um, that landscape was full of people. <laughs> that day, everywhere we went, there were people on every ridge and every hill and yelling to each other and talking about stuff. And there were people all over the place. And I kept asking, well, like, who is that? And who is that? All these places I'd never seen anyone. Oh, that guy keeps his goats over here. And his nephew lives behind that hill. And this landscape was full of people. And they all knew exactly what was going on. Just because I didn't see them didn't mean that they weren't out there. It turned out the green was just a signal and everything was fine, but everybody knew what happened right away. News spread very, very fast, and this landscape that I thought of as kind of empty had people living all over it who knew exactly what was going on. So when I think of the Southwest in the past, I start, try and think now of a place that's more like that, where people are used to walking a long way, they're used to walking much faster than I can, and the landscape is full and people know what's going on around them and they have connections to people in other places and they know what's going on in those places and news can spread pretty fast and there's a lot of ways to travel. So we should really be expecting connections more than we're not expecting them. So these connections that we're talking about this year, none of them should probably be a surprise. So instead of that map with the harsh lines on it, uh, I like these maps that Catherine Gilman draws where we have colors and the colors are kind of overlapping because these culture areas overlap. Uh, remember that these are archaeological culture areas, too. So they're arbitrary boundaries defined by archaeologists based on things that we can see, mostly pottery and ways of building houses that archaeologists can see. And we find areas where all those things look the same. We call it a culture area and make it one color on the map. But we don't know if people living in those color blocks even spoke the same languages or not. We don't know if they thought of themselves as the same group necessarily some of the time. And there was probably a lot of overlap from area to area. So although Phoenix is in the Hocom culture area, the Upper Gila is in the Mugion. Uh, there are a lot of connections between them, and people probably had a pretty good idea what was going on from place to place in the past. So I'm going to be focusing on the period between 200 to 1450 or 1500 today, uh, and those are the, that's the landscape full of people that I'm going to be discussing. But that landscape stayed full of people after the period that I'm talking about, and by the time of Spanish contact, it was home to Chiricahua Apache people. So all kinds of interesting ha things happened after this talk stops as well, but that landscape has been full of people for a very long time. So getting into what was happening in that landscape, uh, in the Upper Gila, we see people doing a little bit of agriculture for quite a long time. We see before that hunter-gatherers. I'm really going to start off talking about the first villages and when people were getting pretty serious about farming. So in the Upper Gila, that's the early pit house period, which is from 200 to 500 AD. And we see little villages kind of thinly spread through the area, uh, small groups of pit houses, which sort of like the Hoakam ones, they don't look the same, but they're only partially underground. They're not actually fully in a pit. It's more like a, a house in a pit. Uh, but we see little groups of these. And if you read the textbooks about the early pit house period, you'll read that the early pit house sites are always up in high places, and then people move down to lower places. Uh, some of us are not sure that that's actually true because one of the ways that you recognize early pit house sites is that the pottery is plain brown pottery. But that's something that continues to be made all through subsequent time periods as well. So if one of the ways that you're recognizing sites is by plain brown pottery, um, you're going to miss that if there's a later site on top of it. 
And people did that in the upper Gila and other areas as well. They would put sites kind of on top of each other. They'd build newer structures on top of old ones. So it's possible that some of these sites that weren't in high areas just got buried under other later sites over time. There's a site in the upper Gila that's called Ormond Village that seems to have a couple of early pit houses buried underneath Salado and other later components that I'll talk about later. So the early pit house sites we know about in the upper Gila do seem to be in high places, but they're I and other people think that they're probably ones that are in lower areas as well, and that really makes sense because it's closer to the farmland and people are doing some agriculture now. So people are hunting and gathering using wild resources on their landscape a lot, but they're also doing quite a bit of farming. And again, they're making this plain brown pottery. And over time, we see slowly increasing population, uh, more and more of these clusters of pit houses. In the Hohokam area, where we are right now, this is called the formative period. And although there are things archaeologists focus on that look somewhat different, the general sense of what's going on is kind of similar. You're getting pit house clusters, small pit house villages uh, that are slowly growing in size, more and more houses together, and more and more of these villages in different places on the landscape. And farming, which has been going on for a very, very long time, is getting intensified in this time period. So sort of a similar thing going on in Phoenix as the Upper Gila. And then these villages keep on growing. And in the Upper Gila area, we transition into what we call there the late pit house period. And sites get bigger, and we get some larger pit structures that in that area, we'll often call them kivas or great kivas. They seem to be a great big pit structure that's used for uh, community events and probably ceremonies and things like that. They don't look like the great kivas you may be familiar with in the Chaco area, but they're Mogollon great kivas. And during this time period, people are really farming a lot. That's probably where a lot of their calories are coming from, a lot of their food is coming from. And these sites are pretty much on low first terraces above the floodplains, and we think people are farming in the floodplains and probably in the arroyo mouths, and doing a little bit of upland farming, but a lot of it's in the floodplains, and so these villages low on the first terrace are conveniently situated for that farmland. And one explanation for why we're not seeing them up on high ridges anymore is that people wanted to be closer to that farmland. So there are some signs that although agriculture has been a big deal for a long time, they're really relying on that a lot now. Uh, the pottery sort of transitions during the late pit house period through different phases that I'm not going to drag you through the names of. Uh, but we start out with, we had plain brown pottery before, right, in the early pit house period. Then it starts to get red slipped or red paint put on it. Uh, and then a little bit later in time, they start using red paint on a white slip. So they've covered the brown pot with a white layer of clay. And then they put paint on top of that, which fires red. And then at the end of the late pit house period, they start to fire it black on white. So you can see a series of pretty logical changes in the pottery that they're making. Pit houses go from being circular to square. But um, it's pretty much a sense of what they were doing before has gotten bigger and more intense. And in the Phoenix area, this end of the late pit house period, around 700, is when ball courts start. So that's another thing that's it's similar but different. We start to get great kivas, this kind of integrative architecture in the upper Gila. Uh, and kind of around the same time in Phoenix, we start to get ball courts, which is a different kind of integrative feature that brings groups of people together. But in both places, we're getting a higher population density, even more effort being put into the farming that they're doing, uh, people putting red and white paint on pottery, and people using some big architecture that brings people together. Those things are probably all related. But it's interesting to see that they're happening at more or less the same time in both areas. So that change in pottery I mentioned I'm giving you a quick example of what some of the, the types that archaeologists use to date these changes look like in the Upper Gila and elsewhere in the Mogollon area. But again, that first example, it's a brown pot, and they've put red paint on it. Uh, the second example, it's a brown pot, and they put white slip on it and put red paint on top of that. Uh, then, through time, you go from having red paint to black paint on a white slip. And to some people, that seems like a pretty big change, but it's actually the same paint. They go from firing the pot in an oxidizing atmosphere that turns that paint red to firing it in a reducing atmosphere that turns the paint black. So even though the pottery looks pretty different, if you compare like the early and late examples up there, it's actually a very logical sort of progression through time. They're changing fairly small things and making the pots look different by the end. Another interesting thing about this series of images is that if you're familiar with Hohokam pottery, a lot of the designs and just the way of painting the pots and the colors at least in the top row on that slide, they look a lot like the Hohokam pottery that's being made in those same time periods. So uh, to me, if I'm out on a Hohokam site, since I don't know those as well, 
I see pottery that reminds me a little bit of what's happening in the upper Gila at that time period, and then I have some general sense of when I am. So another indication that um, things are at least changing in similar ways at similar times and probably connected as well, how similar those designs are. When the late Pitas period ends, we start to get into a time when things look a little bit different in the two areas in some ways, but again, similar in others. We've got big established villages now. So the late pit house villages end up with villages from the classic membrane period built on top of them. And people move out of the pit houses, and in the upper Gila, they're building houses out of masonry. And they're building large Pueblo-looking room blocks out of masonry. But they're right in the same places that those late, house, late pit house villages were in many cases. So they're actually sometimes probably purposely touching walls of certain pit houses, and they're very much in the same place. So they've just moved their architecture up and changed their building materials. So they're still on low terraces. They're still right above the floodplains. This is probably the most intensive period here agriculturally. In some places, there's evidence for canals. We don't actually seem to have that in the Upper Gila yet, but it definitely wouldn't surprise me if there was. In the Embrace Valley at this time, for sure, they have canals. Uh, and the population is much higher. They're putting a lot of effort into building these villages. And these are the biggest villages they've ever had in the Upper Gila so far in this classic Embrace period. And the pottery is black and white, sort of following the progression of that slide I showed you a minute ago. Uh, but now this is that famous classic membrane black and white pottery that you see pictures of, and sometimes it's on stamps and things like that. Uh, it's fancy. A lot of it has geometric designs, so that it has animals or people doing interesting things. Uh, and this is really one of the primary things that I think people recognize about classic membrane is this kind of pottery. So it's a, a very iconic attribute. But this doesn't look like Holocom pottery at all, right? And this looks very different. And one interesting thing that happens in the classic membrane period in the upper Gila and elsewhere in the membrane area is that up until now, we've seen pottery from other places in these sites in the upper Gila. But during the classic period, there's very little pottery from any place else. Most of the pottery that they're using is classic membrane pottery. They don't seem like they care to use pottery from other places. Uh, we can tell that they're still in touch with those places. Some of the things they're showing on the pottery are similar. Like there's very hoacom looking shell bracelets painted on some classic membrane bowls. Um, we can see things like obsidian moving around. We can see various signs of connections, but the pottery connection uh, doesn't seem to be a thing people want to express anymore. So one idea is that it became very important during this time when, again, there's more people living together than you've ever had before and kind of a new kind of community that it's probably very important to people to show that they're a member of this kind of community. And one of the ways that you do that is you show that you use just this type of very distinctive decorated pottery, and you're not really messing around with everybody else's types. So what's going on in Hokam land at this time? You start to get, you, well, you're really in the middle of the ball court world. So the ball court system is a very big thing uh, down here in Phoenix during that time period. So um, that's another kind of interesting thing that's similar but not the same now, is that you've got a great big system that's spread over a wide area where a lot of people are doing a very, very similar thing together in both places, but the things they're doing are not the same. They don't look as much alike as they did in those earlier pit house periods. In the classic membrane area, uh, a lot of what people are doing together as a large group seems to have moved into plazas. They're not formal plazas. They're kind of an open space between blocks of rooms. Uh, but we think a lot of the things that people are doing that gather big groups are happening in those plazas, whereas in the Hokam area, obviously, the ball courts are a place to do that sort of thing. So, again, we've got uh, more people living together than ever have, and they need something probably to bring them together. In the Membrace area, it's probably the plazas, and down here, it's probably the ball courts. So this is, again, similar but not the same anymore between the two places. And then it changes quite a bit after, in the upper Gila at least, 1130. People move out of those big villages, and that's a really big deal, because remember, they've been living in pretty much the same place for centuries. They had late pit house villages transitioning into classic membrane ones, and then in most places, in the upper Gila, for sure, as far as we can see, everybody leaves those villages, and many areas, most people move out of them, including the upper Gila. We don't have a lot of good evidence for people living in the Upper Gila at this time period. In some places, like the northern part of the Membrace Valley and the eastern part of the Membrace area over by the Rio Grande, we can see where people kind of disperse into little scattered communities a little bit more easily. In the Upper Gila so far, that's been very hard to see. There's a couple sites that may be candidates for something that happened right after 1130, but uh, we don't know much about them yet. 
So not everyone left, but things changed a lot. And a lot of villages were residentially abandoned, at least. People stopped living in them. And we know that the population density was a lot lower, a lot lower and the population was a lot lower. But the pottery shows connections to other regions now. So people stop using that classic membrane black on white, and they start using pottery from other places that are around them. And that makes a lot of sense, because there's not a big regional system to connect to anymore. You're going to want to connect to other things that are still going. Interestingly, in the Hohokam area, again, we have not exactly the same timing, but a, a sort of similar sort of phenomenon where the ball court world ends, and identities down here seem to be much more valley-based. So you don't have a great big ball court system that unites everybody the way that we did before, and we have valleys doing things that look similar and making the same kind of pottery and things like that. So again, interesting that in both places, close to the same time, the big system kind of dissolves, and people become much more locally focused for a short period of time. It's an interesting sort of transition or reorganization in both places at once. And then in the 1200s, uh, the Upper Gila is an odd place during this time because it stays pretty empty. In other places, we can see people in the Mogollon area showing connections to the Tularosa area to the north, uh, across the Rio Grande to the east, connections to the south, connections to a lot of different other places. But in the Upper Gila, sites from this time period have been very few and far between hard to see. One of the few that we know about is just outside Mule Creek, and it's called Fornhole, and it's where Catherine Dungan's dissertation work was. Um, and that's one of the few places where we really know about what was going on in this, this time period. So there are some villages that are good size, but there's not many, and the population in the Upper Gila seems to be much lower. There's not a lot going on in terms of people numbers here. And again, the pottery is showing connections to other places. Here, the Hohokam looks quite different because in the Hohokam area, we're starting to get platform mounds now. And that's another big system that's bringing a lot of people together. So the upper Gila and the Mogollon area stays kind of fragmented and not dense in terms of population at a time when Hohokam is building back up and getting big again. So now things aren't really going along the same way as they were before. Um, which, again, is interesting. I don't know why any of these things are, by the way. Um, <laughs> the things that are occurring at the same time in different times, we actually have a plan at Archaeology Southwest to, to study that exact thing over the next few years. We have people who work in a lot of different parts of the Gila, and we're all kind of talking to each other and comparing what's going on. What's going on in your area now? What's this? Uh, and trying to put that information together and see if we can get a better sense of why certain things are happening at once and why other things are different. And you'll be hearing different people's version of that throughout this year. So I'm just raising a lot of questions. Don't expect me to answer them at the end, because I'm not going to. But maybe in about three years, we'll have better ideas. But this is a time when things are a little bit different between Hohokam and the Upper Gila. But eventually, large villages, more large villages, rise again in the Upper Gila, and we get into the Salado period, uh, 1300 to 1450 plus, which means we don't have a great end date. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But now we have a lot of occupation in the Upper Gila again. So instead of just having a few big villages like Fornholt, uh, there's quite a few more of them. And in the Upper Gila, the Salado time period is actually called the Cliff Phase. And it's named after the town of Cliff, which is right where we work, which is pretty neat. Um, there were probably more people living in Cliff back then in the 1300s than there are now. It was a really big population center. And it was a center for a lot of interesting, exciting stuff that was going on. So the pottery now is connecting to a larger system again, but it's connecting to the Salado system. And now we finally, and this very neatly ties places together, we have Salado connecting Phoenix and the Upper Gila. So you can see on the map that Salado is an overlay on top of the other culture areas. And I'll talk a little bit more about why we've drawn it like that. But Salado is something that spreads over culture areas that, to archaeologists at least, were formerly different things. And it looks different in different places where it goes, but it has certain things in common, like pottery and architecture, that holds it together and makes this kind of Salado overlay on top of what was already there, which is pretty neat. So we're getting into this, this time period. And for the next part of this talk, I'm going to focus on uh, what our field team has been finding in the upper, upper Gila and what that tells us about how Salado spread and what's going on up there. So first, I'm going to introduce you briefly to who those people are. Um, I didn't do everything in this talk by myself. It would have been impossible. And um, so I just want to briefly mention the other people who work on this and have come up with a lot of the information that I'm summarizing here. When I came to Archaeology Southwest, Brett Hill and Deb Huntley had been directors of this field school before me. And I'm a co-PI on this project with Jeff Clark at Archaeology Southwest. And every year since, I think, 2009, 
Uh, there's been archaeology from Archaeology Southwest and often a field school going out there. So we've had a lot of field school staff and field school students who've done a lot of the research that I'm going to be summarizing. So here are some of those people. And here are our field school crews since I got here, 2014 through 2018. Uh, and we've worked on a series of different Solado sites in the upper Gila. We worked uh, especially at Dinwiddie and at Gila River Farm, which is one that I'll be talking a little bit more about today. But these are the people who did all these things that I'm telling you about tonight. And especially our field school students. And I wanted to briefly mention that um, the National Science Foundation has a program called the REU program, which stands for Research Experiences for Undergraduates. And we've been lucky to have two grants from that program that basically help our undergrads attend the field school. Field schools now cost about $4,000 or even more in most places, which is very expensive for college students, especially since field schools happen in the summer, and that means that you can't work in your summer job. So that really puts things out of reach for a lot of people. And this RU program is designed to help address that so that people can afford to go to these programs who couldn't go otherwise. And it's especially designed to bring a more diverse group of students into the field. So students whose communities have been underrepresented in your field in the past to try and just incorporate a more diverse group of people. So you can see some of the, the stats of different groups of people we've had from that program and also in red are the states that our students have come from. So we run this program, Archaeology, in South, South, Archaeology Southwest and the University of Arizona together uh, since 2011 have run this field school together. But our students don't all come from U of A. We've had some from ASU and we've had a lot from all over the country, uh, including two-year colleges, community colleges, because uh, those students often don't have as many choices in their summer experiences and in like how many labs they can work in and things like that. So that's been a really important target group for us. And it's really great because we get students from all different places and they're all working together and are all doing the same work. So a lot of our students, for example, have come from Cochise College down in Sierra Vista and they'll be working in the same unit next to people from like Vassar and Bryn Mawr and places like that that everyone's heard of and they're all doing the same thing and it makes people realize we can actually all do the same thing. We just happen to go to different colleges. So it's, that's been really great to see. And this is important for archaeology, too, because uh, it brings together people who have different perspectives and different backgrounds. If everybody had the same background as me, they come up with a lot of the same ideas that I do, and we'd be missing whole sets of things I never even thought of. And I see this interacting with our students all the time. So having a more diverse group of voices is really helpful in thinking through some of the things we're trying to figure out. And that's not always easy to do. We have a group of people living together for six weeks. They're friends, by the way, but it looks like they're fighting. <laughs> we have a group of people living together for six weeks, camping in tents around a little field house in a pretty isolated place, and they did not pick each other. And I technically picked them, but I picked them on paper. I had not met them. So a bunch of people who might not really fit together and sometimes don't really fit together at first. And we have to figure out ways to work together and get along, even though we're all very different and come from very different places and sometimes believe very, very different things. But when you're stuck together for six weeks and you can't escape, mostly you figure out ways to make it work. So that's a big thing that our field school is about. And especially in a time when people talk about bubbles and how often people end up only interacting with people who are a lot like them and don't, not leaving their bubble to interact with different people. You cannot stay in a bubble in this field camp. We're camped practically on top of each other. So you have to interact with people who are different from you. And that's really important, um, I think, in society now for us to be able to do that, especially when you're at that college age, when you're learning a lot of new things. And it's also very symbolic of what we're studying because we do have different groups of people coming together into Salado. So I'll talk a little bit more about that and how we've figured that out now through the work that these students are doing. But in Upper Gila, this Salado inclusive ideology you can see on the map, that red blob is the same as the overlay that you saw on the earlier map with the culture areas. Um, in the 1200s, people in the Four Corners area are in kind of a rough situation. There's uh, a climate that's not so productive for agriculture anymore. There seem to be other signs of resource stress. There's social problems going on. A lot of things are not working out as well as they had been kind of at the same time. And it looks like people in the Four Corners decided, well, this isn't working. We should probably try something else. So if you read about in the late 1200s at Mesa Verde, for example, people mostly left Mesa Verde. A lot of them ended up on the Rio Grande, as far as we can tell archaeologically. Uh, if you go a little bit farther over to the west, that same time, kind of the same area, but west in the Cayenta area, similar things are happening there, and people also decide that they need to try something different and they need to move somewhere else. But instead of ending up on the Rio Grande, archaeologically, the people we can see from the Cayenta area, a lot of them seem to move south, and some of them end up 
in the Hoakam area. And Jeff Clark gave a talk about that in the last season of Archaeology Cafe that you can watch if you want to. Uh, you should. It's good. And some of them also end up in the Upper Gila, and that's what I'm going to be talking about more today. But we recognize them archaeologically by the things that they're moving with them. That's how we know this is happening. But we start to see those things that were characteristic of the Cayenta area appearing in the Upper Gila, and that's how we're figuring out that those people are probably moving down there. I'll talk a little bit more about what those things are. Part of what we're looking at is pottery. That's one of the things archaeologists love to use to try to recognize people. Uh, when you see pottery that's decorated in a very different way, um, like this Maverick Mountain pottery, there's different ways it could have gotten there. Maybe people carried it down there. Maybe people traded it down there. Maybe people moved down there and started making it. Uh, decorated pottery is a little harder to figure out because that's when it's very likely to be traded and get there a lot of different ways. We do see decorated pottery styles that look like things from the Cayenta area showing up in the Upper Gila uh, in the very, very late 1200s and the 1300s. We also see undecorated pottery showing up down there. So that perforated plate, for example, that is a household item. It's not a fancy looking thing that's going to get traded over a long distance. It's just something people use in their house. And archaeologists think for a variety of reasons that they're probably used in the pottery making process, although we're not sure exactly how. But they may be something like a puki, like the base for forming a bowl in. Some of them have clay stuck to them, for example. So this is something, it's a utilitarian thing. It's not a thing that's going to tr be traded in large numbers far and wide. So when we start finding a whole lot of them in a place that didn't have them traditionally, we think that's probably actually people moving that thing, and it's not that thing being traded down, which is a problem you'd get with decorated pottery. So we start to see in the Upper Gila area both this new kind of decorated pottery and also these more utilitarian things like the perforated plates. In some places, we start to see people building houses that look a lot like Canada houses. We haven't seen that in the Upper Gila yet, but we've seen that in other places in the Southwest. So these are the kind of things that we're looking at to see that people are moving from that Cayenta area south and ending up in the Hoakam area and what I'm talking about ending up in the upper Gila area. So there's a, there's a lot of moving. Things are kind of different. Often when you get people moving around a lot on the landscape and the culture changing, people get very tense about it. Uh, in the upper Gila, we can see places where the new people moving in, people from the Cayenta area, live in a specific part of the site, uh, a site just outside of Mule Creek called Three Up, uh, we could see a little a little place where people who had stronger Cayenta connections seemed to be living separately from the rest of the Salado site, and then eventually it all kind of blended in together. Uh, in other places, we see much more spatial separation where uh, places like Goat Hill and Safford, where it looks like there are little Cayenta enclaves. A really good place to see this happening is in Arizona, uh, southern Arizona in the San Pedro area, where Jeff Clark and others have talked about um, places where you can very distinctly see people of Cayenta heritage. On this map, those sites on the south part of the map seem to be places where people from the Cayenta area ended up, and they're all living in the same kind of house, and they're using the same kind of pot. And if you go farther north on that same valley, people who look more traditionally Hoakam are living in those villages. And what happens when a bunch of immigrants come in, again, people get kind of tense about things changing, and people do things like they build walls. So um, you can see Reeve Ruin has this big wall built across the end of the mesa, and that shows nervousness and people being afraid of immigrants and trying to keep things separate. And that's a thing people always do. When your culture changes, you get kind of nervous, and people kind of worry about the new people. Uh, and you can see archaeologically things getting sort of tense. Um, but after some time passes, a uh, generation or two, it seems like people relax a little bit and they realize that just because things are changing doesn't mean they're necessarily getting bad and we don't see so much positioning for defense. People stop building walls, people stop living in enclaves, and we see people moving in together a little bit more. So now people are forming what we refer to as multi-ethnic communities. So in the Upper Gila, that means people whose ancestors were Mugion and people whose ancestors were Cayenta are all living in the same places and probably families have ancestors from both places now, but they're all Salado. So something like an ethnicity, where your ancestors, ancestors are from one place, but they're all living in the same culture now, which is the Salado culture area that I've been talking about. And we see this in a couple different ways. Um, we see perforated plates in these sites, and their use continues, so people still seem to be using these in the new places. Their Cayenta ancestors brought this tradition, and people are still using them. Uh, we see pottery that's decorated with symbols that integrate people. So instead of some people in the village having 
Kayenta-looking pots and some people having Mogollon-looking pots. Everybody is using pots that have iconography on them that archaeologists associate with uh, bringing people together. A lot of Mesoamerican symbols like parrots and snakes and things like that that we think are referring to an ideology that's a, a sort of unifying one that everybody can buy into and it doesn't matter whether your parents were Mogollon area people or Kayenta area people. You can all participate in this. Uh, a cool thing that we see is vessels that have smudged interiors. So you can see this one on the picture, the inside of it's black, and that's something that's done on purpose. The pot is fired in such a way that it gets a very thick coating of carbon on the inside that's polished in, and that's a very traditional muggy own thing to do, a very muggy own way to make a pot. So in the upper Gila area, we have this muggy own tradition of having a smudged inside of your pot, and then the outside of the pot is a suado pot. So it's really neat to see that this muggy own tradition is being incorporated into what's becoming salado. We also see these things called mealing features in some of the rooms, which are um, a bowl and a grinding stone that are kind of plastered into the floor so that you can grind your flour directly into the bowl. And that's been in the Mogollon area before, and that also seems to be something that lasts through time in these multi-ethnic communities. So it looks like we go through a period of tension with new people and things changing, but then we end up with a system where everybody can be a part of it. And I'm not saying that it was easy all the time, Probably there was some conflict, but it wasn't violent conflict, and it wasn't the kind of conflict that ends up with haves and haves nots and some people having big fancy houses who had one kind of ancestor and some people not, or people having big differences in health. We don't really see any of those disparities archaeologically. So I'm sure there were differences, but it looks like people pretty much ended up getting along from what we can see archaeologically in the record, and we ended up with a system that didn't disempower people or leave anybody out, which is a pretty important thing. One of the places where we've been studying these processes is a site called Gila River Farm. Um, and that site is a plowed field. If you go and stand on it, you can't really see much. There's one little mound of architecture, and the rest of it's pretty much been scraped flat. Um, but we've been doing a lot of wall trenching with picks with our students, um, getting them to know and love large tools to uncover uh, a better and better plan map of the site and investigate some of the rooms there. Um, this is what the site plan looks like now, the red. You can see we've completely changed our idea of what the site plan even looked like. So this has been teaching us a lot about how this happened. And we're seeing some of the things I mentioned at Gila River Farm. So things like mealing bins. There, we've excavated in two big blocks of rooms there, and mealing bins are showing up in both blocks of rooms. Uh, perforated plates are showing up in both blocks of rooms. So it doesn't look like we have a big spatial separation between people of Kayanta ancestry and people of Mogollon ancestry. All of the things are in all of the places. They're concentrated more in some places than others, but they're not really separated. So that's been a really interesting thing for us to see. We've also seen things that are different at this site from other places that we've worked. We have very interesting room closure deposits, for example, from Gila River Farm that are quite varied. Uh, one room had a lot of axes left in the hearth in different stages of manufacture. Another room had ground stones associated with one of these mealing bins that were in different stages of use wear. And all these things were put in, it looks like on purpose, when people stopped living in the room and then left in there while the room kind of filled in. So it looks like something people put in there on purpose when they stopped using the room. We don't know why, but it was a, a purposeful thing. Uh, another room had a lot of different kinds of bird bones on the floor, for example. These are things we haven't seen in other Salado sites and other sites in the Upper Gila. So there's a lot of variability in what's going on there. Fish bones has been another fairly surprising thing. We have more than 400 bones from fish at Gila River Farm. Uh, I've been looking at animal bones from a lot of places in the Mimbrace region, and this is a very, very unusually large number of fish bones. People think, oh, they're all along rivers, so of course they're using fish, but um, Fornholt has the next highest number of fish bones, and it's less than 200. That's how different this place is. And those are almost all from one particular pit and a floor that seems to have been a special deposit. Uh, and other than that, we have very, very few from other places in the Upper Gila or the Mimbrace area in general. So again, something looks very, very different about this site. Uh, another site we work called Dinwiddie has an interesting sort of water-related link where people are making shell ornaments out of a freshwater mussel called Anodonta. And I know this from working with Chris Lang, who's a shell expert. Anodonta has to be worked within about two days of picking up the mussel or else it becomes so brittle that you can't make anything out of it. So this is kind of neat because it shows that people are probably getting Anodonta right there out of that creek. You're not going to run across a long distance with a tiny little mussel shell probably in order to work it. You're going to do it right there. So there's some actually argument about the native range of this mussel. So this is actually telling us about an issue that's current right now. But again, like that's only Dinwiddie seems to have that so far. So there's a lot of variability in these sites. 
Another thing we're working on at Gila River Farm is dating. That 1450-plus end date is not particularly satisfying. It's actually from Arizona, and we would love to get dates for the Upper Gila Salado period, especially if we can figure out something that's quite late. So Leslie Aragon and some colleagues at the U of A have been working on trying to do a kind of radiocarbon dating called wiggle matching on some beans and corn from the Gila River Farm site to get a better end date. So just some different exciting things that are going on. We're looking at differences in mobility. If you look at things like how worn out floors are or how recent, how often they've been replastered or how many repairs people do to their superstructures, you can tell some things about how long people are continuously living in these sites and whether people are moving out and coming back and repairing them. And I mentioned our students sometimes think in ways that are different from me, and it's nice to have those things brought in. This was actually a student project. Uh, he wanted to look at some of these indicators of differences in mobility, and I said, yeah, that's a great idea, but I didn't actually think it was going to work that well. But it actually came out very interesting. It surprised me. And it, there are some signs of differences in mobility. People are maybe living less long in these sites, even though they're big. So that was an interesting thing. And we're going to be working a little bit more on that project in December, trying to compare those indicators of mobility with with Membrace Classic sites where people did probably move less often to see if it really is different. So that's been an interesting new source of research there too. Uh, one of the reasons I got excited about that mobility difference was that it explains some of the things that I've been seeing in the fauna from the upper Gila. Uh, if I look at more and less resilient animals to things that humans are doing, the less resilient things, things that don't do as well under a lot of human hunting pressure, they tend to be big things that don't breed as quickly like deer, um, the things that respond really well to having humans living near them, small, fast-breeding things like rabbits. Also, people will put a lot of effort into hunting the less resilient things that end up in the less resilient category. You'll go a long way to hunt a deer, and it's a prestige item when you get it, and you'll have a deer head mounted on your wall, and you don't mount a rabbit head on your wall unless it's a joke, because that's not a prestigious thing to have hunted in most situations. So these things mean that certain categories of animal do really, really well when there's a lot of people around trying to catch them and other categories of animals don't do as well in that situation. And we can see long-term changes over time in these different categories of animal and how they're doing in the membrace area generally, where I've been looking at over 100 assemblages, and in the Upper Gila specifically, this is a graph, but you can ignore most of it, and just focus on the cliff phase, the Salado time period at the end, where you can see that there seems to be a recovery in the less resilient things during the cliff phase. And if you remember back to earlier in this talk, I talked about how there were more and more and more people over time up through classic membrace, and then very few people in the 1200s, and then a whole bunch of people again in the cliff phase. And I always thought, well, maybe the less resilient things recovered really, really well in the 1200s because there weren't a lot of people. But then I always wondered, well, how come in the cliff phase I can actually pick up that there's still a lot of them? Because that's still a 150-ish year period. Um, and we know from studies in the tropics and in places where we have really fine-grained dating like the Four Corners that you can actually impact populations of large mammals in like 25 years. So why aren't they getting swamped by people using them up in 25 years and switching back to rabbits? Uh, if that research on mobility that Steve's doing is, is correct and people are moving more often out of these big villages, maybe people move around the landscape so much that the big animals have a chance to recover. And that would be a really interesting thing to know, too, because that's a really good adaptation if you're moving your villages often enough that farmland can get its fertility back and animal populations can bounce back and things like that. So that's another new area of research that we're going into. So we're learning a lot of interesting new things from our research in the Upper Gila and especially from our research on these cliff phase salado sites up there. And some of them are things that I think have a message for us now. And I really like this slide because... I talked a lot about bringing together Mugion and Hoakam traditions, and if you look at the people in this slide, Will Russell was a Mugion trained archaeologist, although he works in Phoenix now, and he's leaning on this screen that's one of Steve LeBlanc's, LeBlanc's screens from the Memories Foundation excavations in the 70s. And Stacy Ryan was trained in the Hoakam area, and she works part of the time in the Upper Gila with us now as well, and she's holding a leaf blower which is a very traditional excavation tool in the Hoakam region. So we've brought the excavation tools of both places together. And we had a staff when I started. A lot of us hadn't met each other before, and we were trained in different places and different methods. And we came together and had to figure out a way to make it work and a way for us to bring all our different trainings and ideas together into a cohesive thing. And I think 
for whatever reason, we all ended up working it out pretty quickly, and we clicked really well, and I think we really have a situation that's like the best of both worlds now in terms of the different ideas and perspectives that we bring. And every summer, we have all these students who are from very, very different places and backgrounds and have different ideas, and they come together, and they have to form a working sort of unit that gets the work on the site done. And we can only boss them around so much. Some of it they have to figure out on their own, and every year they do. And so this project, with all these different people coming together, is studying a time period when people from two different traditions came together and ended up with a culture, Zolato, culture area, or belief system, or whatever you want to call it. They ended up with a system that included all of the people from those different backgrounds into something that worked, and that didn't disenfranchise people in ways that are archaeologically visible and didn't seem to leave anybody out. Uh, so that, I think, is a really hopeful message for now, when we have a lot of people with different ideas about how to solve different problems and what we should do and where we want to go, uh, that even though if you have a lot of differences, that's something people have always had. People have always moved. People have always had different ideas about what to do. And they've always had to find ways to work out how to live together successfully. And we can see a lot of examples from the past if we look that are depressing and where it didn't work so well, but... I like to look at things like this, where we have examples of where people did kind of get it together, and they figured out a way to make a system that maybe wasn't perfect, but that worked, and that people from very different places could work together to accomplish things that they wanted and end up with a system that lasted. So I think that's something that we can keep on doing. So thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you to the people on this slide uh, who've supported us in all kinds of different ways. If I can just add a little bit of time depth uh, to Karen's last comments there. In the year 2000 to about 2006 or so, at Archaeology Southwest, we had Patrick Lyons, who worked in the in the uh, sort of greater Hopi area. We had Jeff Clark, who came out of the Hoakam area, and Brett Hill, who was an, sort of an environmental uh, perspective. The three of them worked together and sort of did set the underpinnings for a lot of the things that Karen has been set, uh, talking about here tonight. So this is that bringing diverse ideas together is really important and it's worked really well. So um, open it up to questions. How does one get a contact to get into the field that he's uh, majored in? It can, it can be hard. Um, when I started college, I was a chemistry major which I turned out to be terrible at and hate. <laughs> but, um, but my parents thought that was great. Um, but then when I switched to archaeology, my mom especially was kind of horrified because she said, well, how are you ever going to get a job? And sometimes it takes a while. So um, most of our students, again, like your grandson, it sounds like, they attend our field school and then they graduate from college and then they just start sending out resumes to different uh, contract archaeology companies and trying to get sort of uh, temporary jobs uh, some people do internships. The Park Service has some really good ones, uh, or some museums have them. That's one of the really one of the things I really enjoyed doing when I was an undergraduate was a summer internship at a museum. Uh, but it can take a while, and often you have to spend some time in a job that you don't really want before you can work your way into one that you do. So you'll you could get what? Yeah, it can be hard, and then. And the economy affects it a lot, too. Sometimes there just aren't many jobs out there, and everybody's kind of hurting. And other times there'll be a bunch of big projects, and it's great, and everyone thinks, oh, this is a wonderful field. I'll, my future is assured. And then the economy tanks again. So it is up and down, and it's hard. And I think a lot of us have had that sort of struggle where there's times where there's work and there's times where there's not. Uh, but it sounds like he's doing the right things, and you just kind of have to... So the field school announcement comes out in January, right, for... Are you finding uh, evidence of canal irrigation in the upper Gila? We Are have not, but we haven't been looking in the right places. Our excavations have really been focused on archaeological sites. And to find canals, you have to dig um, in the fields and next to the rivers and things like that. Um, I always joke with people who live in Cliff that there's a lot of stuff that we know about places like Tucson because we like to build malls on all of our stuff. Um, malls and sewage treatment plants and freeways and things like that. Those are the kinds of projects where you find things like canals and really early agricultural sites and things like that because you're digging in a place where archaeologists can't see as much and where we wouldn't necessarily pick to dig, uh, like the edges of floodplains. So I bet that there is canal irrigation in the upper Gila, but 
we're not going to see it unless they start building highways and malls, and I don't think the people who live there want that to happen at all. Um, so, I mean, maybe a targeted project with a backhoe at the edges of floodplains or something like that, we might start to turn them up. But that hasn't really been a, a focus of people's research yet. So a lot of things that we don't know about, it's really because we haven't looked in the right places yet. Thank you. I was interested in uh, the finding of the mealing bins in the rooms. Mm -hmm. Before that, or with other areas, um, did you find a, a communal mealing area, or, or how did any indication of how LSAP was practiced, and what the implications might be as to a community doing d uh, different things than that? Because that's, I know, one of the primary occupations you have is grinding corn. Yeah, people spent a lot of time grinding corn. Women spent a lot of time grinding corn, uh, especially. We can tell by the, the muscle markers on their skeletons that they have really big shoulders from grinding corn a lot. Um, and in the earlier time periods, we have monos and matates, and some of them are pretty big, but they're not actually set into the ground. So we think that a lot of the mealing, the grinding, probably took place on the roofs of houses. Sometimes if you have a good assemblage from the roof of a house, it'll have grinding stones in it. Some of it may have been inside the rooms when it wasn't nice out. Um, but people could move them around. You could pick up your matate and take it someplace. So if like all your friends are grinding on the edge of the plaza, you can take your matate there and grind with it, and then you can take it back. Uh, so people did it in probably different, a, a lot of different places in earlier time periods. Uh, and we do start to have these mealing bins in the 1200s in the Mogollon area. Um, which is before the Cayenta people come. Um, but that's a little different because it's a dedicated space for grinding. We don't think people did all of their grinding in those places necessarily because we do find just matates lying around other places as well. But to have a specific space set aside for it where there's a feature built into the floor is kind of new in the 1200s. Uh, I was curious, um, I'm not an archaeologist, so I hope this isn't a dumb question, but is there evidence of people returning back, like in the 1200s, 1300s, of going back north? Uh, like, uh, you know, Cayenta originated, but then returning back? Uh, I don't know enough about that area to really know the answer to that question. But if you talk to people today, it is very important sometimes, if you live in one part of the Southwest, to take trips to an area that your ancestors came from and visit that place and do things in that place and then go back to where you live now. So I'm sure that things like that have happened for a long time. Uh, but I don't know of any archaeological evidence for people returning to that area after they've moved away. Mm -hmm. um, someone like Jeff Clark would probably know more, but I just don't. Well, thank you for a fascinating presentation. Does your research ever allow you to make conclusions or even be predictive about things today? Uh, you've mentioned a couple of things that in, in comments were kind of bridging to what's going on here now. And uh, in my own experience, you know, I spent some time here in Phoenix going to school, owned a house. There were block walls all the way around every house in our neighborhood. And then we moved to Lawrence, Kansas, and there were no walls in between the homes there. So those kinds of things interest me, and I wonder if your work allows you to ever analyze or make prediction or conclusions about stuff like that. Um, my analytical specialty, specialty is actually animal bones, so that's the thing that I spend the most time thinking about probably, even though it's not what I talked about that much tonight. But I think what I was referring to with the uh, animal population recovery has some things that could really help people now because uh, in a lot of parts of the world, like the tropics especially, people still rely on hunting for a lot of the protein that they have. Uh, they don't have a huge variety of foods necessarily that they have access to, and in some places it's really hard to raise animals. So you actually do have to get your meat from hunting wild animals. And... Um, in the past, people moved a lot, and so they gave the animal populations time to recover, and that strategy worked out fine. But now as the human population, population density rises, uh, people don't move as much, and there's more of them kind of packed in a place, and they do impact those animal populations really fast. Uh, and people in those places kind of talk about, well, what should we do to make sure that people can keep hunting, but that they can also um, not lose access to the animals by extirpating them locally or even driving them extinct. And one of the things people in those places talk about is whether to have like a quota system for how many animals you can hunt or something like reserves where you don't go in certain areas and the animals can breed in those places and move down. And some research that I didn't really talk about tonight suggests that in the Southwest, uh, there was 
there were areas that kind of functioned like a reserve. There were areas with a very low human population density always because it was too cold to grow corn or because people didn't get along and it was dangerous to go to a place. And those open areas left places where animals could breed and then they would move down into the areas where there were people. So people who lived in villages near those things functioning as reserves had continued access to things like deer. So knowing that we have that kind of process over centuries is useful to people potentially in places where they're trying to make decisions about how to organize their hunting. We don't know if it's going to work the same way. And since I'm not from there, I'm not going to go tell them to do it because uh, people who live there actually understand what things are going to work. But uh, that is something that if you're trying to weigh two different systems of how to control hunting and you say, oh, in some places reserves worked for a really long time and not just 25 years, that's potentially useful. So I don't think I find things archaeologically that are going to make me go start bossing people around and telling them what they ought to do. But I think I do see things happening that give us a long time perspective on problems that come up again and again and some ways that we know don't tend to work and some ways that sometimes we see them working and give us some kind of hope. So that's how I would answer that, I guess. Um, Karen, I was just going to share a comment from a gentleman on Facebook who I'm going to destroy his name. It's Brian Siopuvitam. Anyway, and he said he just wanted to share that... Um, he was remarking on your comment about the um, perforated plates, and he was saying that he actually makes corrugated pots, and he uses a puki that's shaped like that, and if it's any bigger than that, um, it doesn't work. It distorts and obliterates his co the coils and things like that. So that's just an interesting observation from someone who's still um, making pottery like that. Yeah, thank you. And um, you got a couple field school students watching you tonight, too, oh, so they, they're all very excited to see you, so... <laughs> I think we've got time for maybe one more question here. Um, are you finding any domesticated dog burials at Woodrow? Uh, we haven't found any so far. Um, there are some from sites in that area, but not where we've worked. Uh, another kind of interesting domesticated is Turkey, and this, there's a site called Elk Ridge, which is from the classic membranes and pit house periods that has a lot of evidence for Turkey. But other sites from the same area and time period have just a few bones. So I talked a little bit about how different sites can look very, very different from each other and still be part of the same archaeological culture. And that seems to be another one of those things, that some sites look really different in terms of domesticated animals than all the ones around them. It's hard for us to know why that is, because archaeologists look for patterns to figure things out. And when your pattern is, this one's different, it's very hard to figure out what that means. So there's a lot of interesting, interesting stuff going on, I think, with domesticated animals that's hard for us to see because our samples are so small. Thanks. So we need to bring this to a close tonight. I, I could sit or stand and listen to Karen for many, many hours. Oh, she good. Just is, Tomorrow. <laughs> she's just a, across the courtyard from me, and but to just uh, have the opportunity to hear her tell her story is wonderful. Thank you, Karen, very much for a wonderful night tonight. Thanks.